Welcome to the D.A.R.E. podcast, where it is all about helping people overcome anxiety and panic attacks. The D.A.R.E. app has over 1 million downloads and is free to download at dareresponse.com. Now, without further ado, here is the D.A.R.E. podcast. Hi, guys. Hi, and here's my buddy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. So as for today's structure, Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, but... We're going to start with a highlight, which is nocturnal panic attacks today. Mm -hmm. um, after that, we're going to um, answer some of the submitted questions. And maybe we have five or 10 minutes in the end to welcome a guest live. If you remember how to bring them uh, in. That's what I was just looking at as you were saying that. <laughs> I don't see the, the part anymore. So I guess let's get started. And if I look like I'm looking off to the side, I'm desperately trying to... Um, so as exactly. for nocturnal panic attacks, guys, this is this one comes in a lot because it's I can handle them during the day a little better because I'm expecting it. But really, it it is much harder at night when you're going from a deep sleep, not just to awake, but to a heightened state of alertness. Um, and just to get a sense of who else who else might be finding this little section of our webinar useful in the chat, who else deals with this or has dealt with this or struggles with this or. Like it, you kind of forget what to do in the midst of nighttime when you're being jolted awake at, from sleeping. And who agrees with me that they are the worst of the worst, aren't they? <laughs> because it takes it takes a while until you you understand what the hell is going on with you. Mm -hmm. You're you're terrified in that moment until your rational mind kind of wakes up and reminds you, oh hey, you're just having a panic attack. Calm down. Um, it takes a while. And what often happens during those first maybe up to 30 seconds is that it's not just the panic, but it's also disorientation. Mm -hmm. Many people mm -hmm. report they don't know where they are all of a sudden. And that obviously adds to, to that uh, panic. And then after 30 seconds, I'd say, you remember, okay, I'm in my bedroom, I'm having a horrible panic attack. And now I'm afraid to go back to sleep because it might happen again. <laughs> Mm -hmm. have you experienced that michelle oh yeah not well, not so so much but i have i have woken up with like a weird throat sort of thing which then whoosh gets the whoosh attached to the throat thing and for five seconds it's not sleep apnea but it's like you feel like you can't breathe or you can't swallow and you're almost like paralyzed like you're still your body's still physically asleep but like awake and heightened at the same time and you are in this like desperate mode like you go from this to <gasps> like basically Instant like that panic. <laughs> that's how you wake up and you're like spend you know a few seconds of like what the hell's going on like disorienting it's a good word because it's you really you're it's confusing you don't know what's happening and you've been jolted awake and it's because there's nothing to look at like if you've been jolted awake because your shelf crashed on the floor, you would be jolted awake in fear, but the focus would be on the crash. This is your body just like, wake up, wake up. Yeah. And you're awoken for no reason. For no reason. Just wake up. Yeah. Just because I said, wake yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because sometimes you can identify a trigger. Sometimes, you know, Oh, I'm already so sensitized. And it's been a weird day. Very, intense day maybe day full of anxiety so um it's kind of more normal to to experience nocturnal panic attacks when you're already sensitized but sometimes they just come out of the blue maybe after after a phase where you felt oh things are going really great i'm, I'm making progress with there and and with accepting and then all of a sudden boom uh, they're back and many people then think oh my god this is a bad sign this now maybe means that everything is coming back and then how do i get a grip of this how can i stop them from from occurring michelle how do you stop them michelle yeah. so we're not going to do that they kind of stop on their own you don't directly stop that but also keep in mind it, there might be other reasons like sometimes your body just wakes up at night so whether it's hormones or something else going on so we always you know when it's a physical thing we say it all the time, but I'm just going to say it again because I, I kind of forget there's always new people that come on the webinar. Um, there's nothing wrong with getting yourself checked out. There's nothing wrong with getting a physical if something new is happening or your sleep is kind of messed up or you're being jolted awake because many people have, let's say, sleep apnea or 
or um, GERD, right? Acid reflux, and, and they go to sleep and they, they're very similar symptoms. And so sometimes it's chicken or the egg. I wake up in fear and, or I wake up from something else, which scares me. And now I'm jolted awake and now I'm scared. So now I'm panicking because maybe something else woke me up. Either way, either way, it's always what happens next. Because now what is now you are awake, whether you like it or not. Okay. What generally happens is we get stuck in trying to figure out why trying to we basically assume we're having some sort of heart attack, medical emergency, something's happening. And like, like you were saying, then scared to go back to sleep, because what if it happens again? Right? And if you go back to sleep, braced for something, again, your body doesn't know if you're braced for murderers about to rob you or braced for fear. But you go to bed braced, this guy, your alarm is going to say, Oh, doesn't seem like she doesn't seem to be acting safe for us to go into a deep sleep. So we're going to keep like, wake up, wake up, wake up as the night goes on, because there might be danger because she's certainly acting like there's danger. And so sometimes that first panic attack is really just like the catalyst to how I then act afterwards, which then sets the next ones in place. Mm -hmm. And I also just want to add, if you notice a pattern of nocturnal panic attacks, it is worth to just look into, you know, the basic things, hydration, time when you go to sleep, what do you do the two, one or two hours before you go to sleep? So if it's something that is highly sensitizing, like scrolling through social media, bright lights on stress, you know, all these things, obviously that, that puts our body in a more sensitized state, which means that the likelihood of those nocturnal panic attacks uh, happenings higher. So we're not trying to relax and dim the lights and do all of these things so we can avoid experiencing them, but just to help our body through a phase of high sensitization to fall and stay asleep better. You guys, I know we've been repeating this all the time, but do you understand the difference in self-care as a means to help your body move through sensitization as opposed to doing self care, so you can avoid something. Yeah, so that's in the fine chat. line too for many very people. Very fine, very fine, very fine line. Yeah, but it's it makes the biggest difference, doesn't it, Michelle? Yeah, the biggest difference because it's mindset. Because then it becomes must. Then like good well good wellness routine becomes must or else. And it's the must or else mindset that labels something as danger. So yes, Michelle on here, sleep hygiene. Yes, sleep mm-hmm. hygiene is good. Just like personal hygiene is good. But if it's taken with that mindset of must get my lavender and must line up my circadian rhythm and must do a million things so I can now sleep and use that to fix the problem and check to see, did it work? Did I sleep? It's now like now sleep has become the obsession. Mm-hmm. And, and and all of the sleep hygiene good things then become compulsions. And it's and it's all about attitude and, and and intention when it comes to that. So it would be the same action, but attitude and intention would be different. Yes, yes. And uh, who said it? Ilya, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, doing the right thing for the right reason. Right? Exactly. That, that's it. Right. I'm going and to bed early because it's good for me not not to avoid having a panic attack. Yeah. And you can you can ask yourself the question. I'm sorry, what is going on here? Will, can you hear that? <laughs> I, I can't. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, what was I saying? You can oh, morph I'm that. Kind of fun. And, then, and then you can what? Oh. Morph. Okay. Sorry. I forgot. I'll okay, come back. Come It'll pop it. Okay, It'll pop it when you stop looking right. for it. <laughs> Um, one thing yeah, to mention right in all of this too is um, hypnic jerk. And does anybody not mm-hmm. know that term hypnic jerk? Because that's a super common thing that happens, especially if um, you've been through a period of stress or you're really exhausted or tired lately. Um, does anybody not know what that is? A hypnic jerk? I try and like make sure I repeat that every once in a while. It's a yeah. oh, it's giving new information for the first time. You've all have probably experienced before. It's mm-hmm. like when you go to sleep and, and you're 
almost asleep or you just crossed into sleeping and you feel like you're falling and you you jump awake it's called a hypnic jerk do you guys know what i'm talking about now where you, that's like that falling sort of feeling yes yeah okay here comes the weirdest the weirdest experience that it can be so annoying because you're you you just notice oh I'm just about to fall asleep and it's going to feel so good. Finally, I can fall asleep. And then you drift away and then boom, there you are again. And it, it can feel really like a punch punch yeah. to, to your stomach. And there are different reasons why, why this might happen. Again, nervous sensitization is, is number one. It's just what it is. It's the nature of sensitization to be to be awake, to be, to be alert, to have um, excess energy in your body that manifests like that. Another reason common reason is that the room is too hot or you're dressed in in too many layers of clothing your body needs to drop its core temperature by one percent in order to be in order to fall asleep and sometimes you know anxiety can come with shivers and you just want to be cuddled up in in your blanket and maybe wear, wear a lot of clothes but that is really counterproductive when you're trying to get a good night's sleep. Even though you might feel good in the warmth or the, the temperature of your room, it is not helpful because you are hindering your body to drop its core temperature. And that can then lead to those hypnic jerks. So you try to fall asleep and oh, you wake up again, you wake up again because it's too hot. So one thing you might try is just opening your windows and uh, having around, I don't know how much that is in Fahrenheit, 17 to 18 degrees Celsius. Does anybody know? Oh, that sounds really red? cold. <laughs> <laughs> it's as cold as this. It's you were in the picture you sent us when your <laughs> and the electricity oh, was off. Sleeping in my, <laughs> in my uh, hat. <laughs> Yeah. And remember, yeah, but fight or flight. You're always hearing us talk about fight or flight, fight or flight, fight or flight. Some some people don't really know the other rest and digest, but that's it's kind of like picture it like a seesaw. If fight or flight mode is up, rest and digest mode go down. And so um, fight or flight is designed to jolt you into action. Rest and digest is good. It's for survival, too, but not right now survival. You don't have to eat right now. You don't have to rest right now. Those are conducive for survival, like not right now. Like So rest and digest is to jolt your body into action. Okay. Rest, digest, and sex. I throw that in there too. Nobody ever mentions that one. I knew she, I knew she would say that. You. Why? <laughs> I just knew it. Sorry, honey, I'm fighting and fleeing today. Sorry. You don't, see, you don't have to use headache anymore. You just have to say you're fighting and fleeing today. But like, because it's least conducive for right now danger. And so if you are, so let's say they're not a one-off panic attack at night. Let's say you know you've been in a heightened state. You know you've been, or just even extra stressors, or you know you're maybe having generalized anxiety or having panic attacks during the day, and, and you're, you're not in this dare mindset space yet. Expect sleep to be affected expect your mm -hmm. expect your appetite to be affected that's kind of how a person who's looking for a danger is kind of supposed to be because it helps you stay alive expect to not be interested in having sex expect to to not feel, have much of an appetite or eat well and have and expect digestive, your, right? digestive issues digestive. Mm -hmm. your sleep mm -hmm. is lighter it's harder to fall asleep it's yeah. just par for the course it comes with the territory yeah. And when you go through such a phase, well, how would you treat somebody if a loved one, friend of yours would be going through such a phase and you would know they're sensitized, their sleep is off, their appetite is off. How would you treat them? Right? You would maybe try and cook something special or help them unwind and calm down somehow because you are trying to, to help them move through that phase and try to treat yourself in the same way. When you know you are sensitized and your sleep will be affected and your appetite will be affected, try those basic things like dimming your lights two hours before going to bed, taking a warm bath, um, having the temperature right in your room, reading something, some fiction books, and maybe not scrolling through social media. It is really helpful. We sometimes we just forget how important it is to, to take care of our physical well-being. Anxiety is very, very physical. And even if you don't have any anxious thought during the night and you're not dreaming some weird stuff about anxiety, still, if, you, if your body is, is just overly sensitized, it can 
um, produce those nocturnal panic attacks, which might be hard then to, to, to contribute to something physical, but people directly jump to, oh my God, anxiety is back. Mm-hmm. Oh my mm-hmm. God, what did I do wrong? How can I dare through this? Maybe there's nothing to dare through, but rather doing the basic things that, that help your body be a little bit more stable in a phase where it's, where it's very sensitized. Right. And remember, just like you don't get to decide what you dream. You don't get to decide if you have gas in the middle of the night. You don't get to decide. This is, again, when we're talking about anxiety, autonomic nervous system, automatic things that you don't get to control. So you don't get to decide if you have a panic attack or not. You don't get to decide if you fart in your sleep or not, right? Like you don't get Mm -hmm. to decide a lot of these things. And that's where like trying to control things that are not in my control or pre-control things that could happen that it almost sets the scene for (laughs) you to be in a heightened state when you go to bed. And like Mm -hmm. somebody was posting in the chat, what about your fear of sleep? It's the same thing. I am telling a story about sleep and, and the story I'm telling is there's some sort of danger about to happen. Okay. And I know sleep is driven hard into healthy to sleep. And it's like, you should really get a good night's sleep and try to get eight hours of sleep. Yes, that's is healthy. And that is a good advice, but we like to take things to the nth degree. And then it's, we start treating not sleep equals danger and equals danger right now and must sleep or else. And so then it becomes not just a sleep problem, it becomes a 24 hour thing where it's, okay, I better sleep. So I'm, who does this post in the chat? Okay, I got to get a good night's sleep. So I'm less anxious tomorrow. So I feel a little bit more connected because I've been feeling DPDR lately, or I have a meeting. And if I don't get sleep, my anxiety is going to be worse. And then you wake up in the morning, your anxiety is worse. Here comes all the comments. Now, now I'm dreading sleep at night. And oh my gosh, here it comes. I hope I sleep because if I don't sleep, what if I, ne- what if I never sleep again? And then I'm so anxious and I can't handle anxiety. And then you just fighting everything. You're fighting being awake. You're fighting being asleep. You're fighting how you feel. Um, and then like medication helps to put your body to sleep. And we, we are here to teach the space of like, in order for your body to naturally fall asleep, it has to get this message that it's safe to do so. Yeah. And, and get the right nutrients and circumstances so it, it can have a good night's rest. Yes. But and I, again, forgot what I wanted to say. I don't know what's going on today. <laughs> Because okay, you're trying too hard to remember. <laughs> what that? I'm trying too hard. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah, um, I got it. So what, what Michelle just mentioned, um, I want to sleep, but I can't sleep. And then tomorrow I have this meeting and then I'm going to feel like this. And yeah, you know, it's true. Of course, if you only sleep two or three hours, you're more likely to be anxious, more anxious the, the next day. Obviously, you may be, you're not going to be as focused in your meeting as you would be with a good night's sleep. But the thing is, there's, absolutely zero that you can do about that and anxiety lives in that space where you imagine a worst case scenario so tomorrow I'm going to be more anxious because I'm not going to sleep tonight and I I don't want that I want to avoid that at all costs so and this is where, where anxiety comes in because that anxiety wants you to to get in action and and prevent that worst case scenario from happening but because you can't it's out of your control all you're left with is that anxious feeling. So a good technique in that moment is to to just notice that your mind is going there. It is normal. We all want to have a good night's sleep. Nobody wants to be awake. Nobody wants to experience panic attacks. Nobody wants to be unfocused in their meetings. Nobody wants that. So it's it's human nature. It's totally normal to to wish that to, um, to happen, but it's not in our control. So try whenever you notice your mind is wandering there to bring it back the present moment and ask yourself, what can I do in this very moment to assist my body to get a good night's sleep? And it could be something as simple as I'm, I'm going to choose to not scroll through social media the next two hours, but instead do something more calming. That is really all that you can do. And when you let go of that control of trying to prevent yourself from not sleeping or experiencing panic attacks, this is where you will feel immediate relief 
because there's not this friction of trying to control something that you can't control. It's this friction, this that is the anxiety you can't stand. It's this friction that is so exhausting, not the anxiety or, or the fact that you're not sleeping well. I've not been sleeping the past few months for, I don't know, more than four hours or so. I just recently started again. I was due to other reasons, but I was alive. Nothing happened. I right. Didn't know just like you have babies, right? You kind of, yeah. and that's why it's, it's, it's also notice your story about not sleeping because I am a terrible sleeper. My anxiety has not imprinted itself to sleep for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Um, my imprinted to something else. So mine is not merged. I don't have fear attached to sleep because also my story about not getting a good night's sleep is, mm, I guess I'll just be tired the next day. And it's a period, not a limit. You're not trying to control it. Right. And, and so like yeah. me not sleeping doesn't equal I've lost my job and my family and my career, and I'm going to be stuck in this anxious state forever. But with the stories we tell about the, the facts are you're awake, whether you like it or not, your story about those facts, right? One person's story might be, oh, three o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they don't have much of a story. It's, well, that kind of stinks. And I wish I was sleeping, but oh, well, there's nothing to be done. If you're telling a story of danger, a story involving, if this doesn't get changed, my whole life will be altered. And, and you're like telling a story based on the last story. That's where we catastrophize and then sleep becomes danger. Yeah. I love sleeping. Sleeping is my hobby. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I, I went through a phase of insomnia where my fear was attached to sleep. And it was not long, maybe, I don't know, three or four weeks, but I did all the wrong things that you shouldn't do. All the things mm -hmm. we just mentioned here. Trying to fall asleep, taking the lavender baths, right? dropping the temperature in my room so I can fall asleep, not because I would help my body, but right. because that's the last missing thing. <laughs> and, and now I will sleep. So after two weeks, I was like, well, damn it, this is just getting worse. So then I, I changed my approach. So what I did then might sound silly, but it worked just, just, just fine. I just accepted I'm not going to sleep. I'm not going to sleep. And I prepared for not sleeping. So I prepared myself a snack, left it next to my bed and said, oh, 2 a.m. And I'm, if I'm still awake, I'm sure I'm going to be hungry. So I'm going to have that cookie and a <laughs> glass of milk. And I'm going to I'm going to continue watching my series. When am I going to do that during the day? I'm working. I have a family. What am, what am I going to watch my my series? So that's a fantastic opportunity. Guys, it was maybe four nights and it was done. Right? My body naturally went back to sleep. Your body knows how to sleep, by the way. Yeah. You don't forget. fight yourself to sleep. <laughs> Your body does sleep. Yeah. You show it where it's safe to sleep or not by how, where you put it, how you treat it. If, oh, it, it, the room is dark, it's comfortable. I've, I'm laying down. There's no tension in my body. I'm not like this. You don't go, right? You don't fight yourself to sleep. You're, you're, you provide rest to your body. And then once your body sees it's safe to sleep, it may fall into deeper levels of rest, right? Mm -hmm. One of which is sleep. And so it may fluctuate. If you're in a heightened state, it may fluctuate a little bit more and maybe not get uh, very deep for the period of time and kind important of float, point. float through that too. Yeah. Very important point Michelle is making. So if you have not been sleeping for a while or, or not as much as you want to, sometimes we wish that we would drop from not sleeping at all or just a little bit to deep restful sleep. And it just takes a while for your body to settle back down in its natural rhythm of, of deep sleep. So allow that. If you notice, oh, I slept two hours more um, than I did yesterday, or I just feel in general a little more rested than I was, even though I got the same amount of hours of sleep. That's fantastic. But just give your body some time to to get back into its natural rhythm. It will. Again, it knows how to sleep. And I think this is what we sometimes forget. It's the same with driving anxiety all of a sudden. You've been driving your car mm -hmm. for 30, 40 years, and you never thought about it. And all of a sudden, you have this thought, what if I forget? Right. Driving right. Is, a, is a subconscious thing. Yeah. It's not a conscious thing. You don't think about how am I, when am I going to turn my steering wheel now here? How many meters do I have to stop? You just do it automatically. And then sleep is even more intuitive. 
Yeah. And so spending more time involved internally focus on sleeping and trying to do the right things does not allow, again, the opposite of all this is trust. And so the trust is kind of just leave my body alone. And it's not my job to sleep. It's my job to lay down. I mean, I can choose to lay on the hard floor or lay on the soft bed. I'm going to lay on the soft bed. It's more comfortable. I'm going to like, you're more likely to fall asleep when you're comfortable, when you're again, sending this message of safety. And when you provide that to your body, the rest is not your job. You are not in control of what happens next. My body may or may not fall into deeper levels of sleep in between the periods of when I've decided to lay down and when I've decided to get up. In between there, not my job. And you let go of control. So much of this is about trying to control the non-controllable parts of us. And sleep is a huge one. I think that we'll wrap up with that and move to some questions. Um, final, Final note for me. Those two hours before you go to bed, they are really, really important. They can have the biggest impact on on how your night goes. So take this simple tip and then try to to just set prime your body for calmness those two hours before you go. So a light meal, dim lights, reading something, calming down, maybe doing a meditation. Uh, it's, It's really helpful. And guys, just to let you know, we're doing these little snippets in the beginning, really to help our podcast a little bit, because we were taking bits and pieces from our regular webinars, but sometimes they were just a bunch of Q&As. Um, you know, sometimes one or two of us, usually me, this one goes off a little bit of a rant. And if people don't know us, it sounds a little funny on the podcast. So we thought we were trying to take little topics Um, especially things that come up most often and use that to kick off these webinars. And then that will be our podcast. Um, So if you guys have any suggestions, I'm afraid to even say that if you guys have any suggestions for topics, you can even send it in um, to support at dairy response. Um, No, no. What's, what's the better one? Support. I think. Okay. Support at dairy response.com. I mean, why not? We're already going to be talking about anxiety. We might as well have like the first 20 minutes about self-care or intrusive thoughts or derealization. And then we'll take little snippets of that. And then those will be a little more themed parts of our podcasts. Yeah, I will talk about everything. We're just going to rotate topics. (laughs) Cool. So Um, I'm having a hard time pulling up the... um, the questions on my other laptop and it's, which means I have to keep clicking back and forth it. off of here. So if I no, you don't have to, I, I can, I can read them. No problem at all. But I would like to start with a question I saw in the chat popping up a few times. And that is, well, how do you desensitize? How do you help the, the sensitization? How do you make your body less sensitive? I think it's such an important one because everything starts with the sensitization, right? If it wouldn't be for sensitization, we wouldn't feel anxiety, we wouldn't have panic attacks, and then all that comes with it. So, Michelle, how do we unsensitize or desensitize our body? Yeah, and so it's you don't do it directly. You allow your body to desensitize based on how you're acting wherever it is that you are. So desensitization is something that happens. Regulation, right? And again, dare sounds a little bit different than what you'll hear from so many other places out there, which is what do I need to do to desensitize? How do I regulate? I'm, I need to directly, I need to practice self-regulation. Who's heard that before? <clears throat> and then usually what that, what comes afterwards is a lot of tips and tasks and actions and writing and things to do to then check to see if it worked. Am I calm yet? And so desensitization is similar to like that approach of like, I'm trying to calm down. It doesn't happen directly. And if it did, nobody would be on this call. You all would have done Mm -hmm. all the things and used all the gadgets you probably bought before. And you would have done a bunch of things to regulate your body. I've never understood that because again, if your body is a self-regulating system, you don't regulate a self-regulating system. (sighs) You show it that it's safe to do so. And so your body, like, your body regulates, desensitizes when it sees she doesn't need fight or flight state anymore. Well, how does it know that? By how you're acting. 
If you are acting like there's a threat or there's danger or something must be gone, it doesn't know if you're acting this way because of snakes or you're acting this way because of thoughts. It knows you're acting this way. So it will it will not allow the natural process of desensitization to happen because it's counterproductive for survival. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's conducive to survival to stay in a heightened state. Our problem really is we are surviving through a heightened state as if the heightened state needs to be gone. And then the heightened state gets marked as danger. So desensitization happens when you, you change how you're acting first. You start acting as if you're safe in the midst of discomfort. The, desens the desensitization process happens. You, it's, it's something that happens when you go into being mode rather than doing mode. Yeah. That was a long ramble, but no, no, fantastic. And think about it this way: sensitize. We always think of sensitization in, in regards to anxiety, but sensitization is this is a normal thing that happens to everybody when you go through stress. Think about a phase of your life that was really stressful, but you you were not suffering from anxiety. You were sensitized then. There are a lot of things that sensitize us. Could be stressful phase of job. Could be having a baby, right? Um, not not having time for yourself, maybe being too busy, overwhelmed, all of that sensitizes our nervous system. Not eating well, not exercising, not hydrating, just the basic things that causes sensitization. But our body, as Michelle said, it goes up, sensitization goes up, but then it calms down. And you all have experienced that before. So as soon as the stress um, subside, your body calm down again on its own without you doing much for it. Maybe you helped it with self-care, but you did not actively desensitize. The problem with anxiety is that we, we keep perpetuating the sensitization by fearing the sensitization. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the thing. So you're sensitized due to whatever. And a classical example are setbacks. Somebody went through a phase of anxiety, came out on the other side, feel fine, feel well, then go through a phase of heightened stress, notice the sensitization, and all of a sudden start to fear their body's response to stress. Oh my God, I feel so hypervigilant, my mind is racing, I'm back in the anxiety loop. No, your body is just sensitized. And if you would just allow your body to regulate itself by not adding fear to it, it would get back into balance, right? So if sensitization is like the basic noise, so to speak, background noise, and on top of that, we add the fear and now we create a, a new little universe, right? That keeps yeah. perpetuating. Meta. It's like meta land. <laughs> yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. meta land. And so and this is where, where, where DARE comes in. So DARE helps you to, to kind of like take your foot off the gas, so your body can then again desensitize, but it does that on its own terms, in its own time. You can assist it in doing so, but you cannot actively press a button and say, okay, I stopped fighting. Now I must desensitize by next tomorrow. And um, to, to wrap that up, Michelle, tell us your, my favorite Michelle analogy, or well, my second favorite, uh, the one with jogging. It's always worth oh. uh, repeating this analogy because it's just, it's so to the point. All right. So, How? so if you go for a run, right, our, our other systems work the same way. We just kind of don't really overthink this with our other systems. Usually um, you go for a run. As long as you keep running, your lungs are going to keep pumping, right? Until you stop running. Right. And so again, these systems are quick to turn on because you need them for survival. They're slow to turn off just because you're in you're you're you still have um more discomfort it doesn't matter when it comes to survival like you don't have to have your lungs turn up go back to normalization the same way as quickly as they went up so as long as you keep running your lungs will keep pumping until mm -hmm. the you've decided all right it's time to stop running and so you don't stop running and your lungs are immediately regulated when you stop running that's when your body gets the message to start the process of winding itself down you don't turn this way and go oh my god now calm down lungs 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 this i'm done i'm done running <laughs> you're still in a state yeah. you're still in involved in in action and doing and so your body calms itself down kind of like like 
my more favorite one is like when you watch a scary movie. You're in a sensitized state when you watch a scary movie, at least a smaller version of it. So I'm watching a movie and now my body is up. Now I hear every crack, every creak in my house. And and my response to it is a little more magnified. What was that? What was that? House is making the same sound, whether you were watching a funny movie or a scary movie, but because I'm in a heightened state, I notice more things. So what do you do about the sensitized state? Like nothing. It come after the movie's over, you keep, you do something else or you watch another show and your body like naturally desensitizes you don't then treat sensitization as danger and then do the same actions and behaviors to desensitize because that's that's now treating a heightened state as the next threat yeah and trust your body your body is well equipped to deal with stress it's been dealing with stress since the beginning of mankind we need stress in our life it's not stress is although it's this buzzword this whole avoid stress team obviously too much stress prolonged stress that never stopped or where you don't have phases and where we can rest and digest obviously it's, it's not healthy and unpleasant right but at the same time we're not these fragile beings that will you know something very bad is going to happen to us as soon as we we encounter a little bit of stress it's fine we are well equipped to deal with it so trust your body yeah and your stress response system is designed to target danger not to target your own stress response system that's <laughs> I say that again, Michelle. Yeah, but it's the core of anxiety. (laughs) Your stress response (laughs) system is designed to, I don't know, somebody has to write that to us in the chat. Your stress response system is designed to help you attend to danger, not to attend to your own stress response system. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Right. To the manifestation, to the physical and mental manifestation of, of, of that response. Heart palpitations, increased breathing. All of all of these things that we start to fear. You should write a daily game on that. Just saying. Yeah, maybe. Sounds like a good title. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're gonna head, head into uh, some questions. How do I overcome anxiety, feeling a uh, feeling alone, and kids moving away? Go on, girl. Wow. Oh, me. Yeah. How do I overcome? Okay, say that again. It's it's much different when I can't see the questions. I got so I know, used to seeing I them. Know. It's weird to not see them because <laughs> I always pick out the words. How do I overcome? Yeah. This sounds How like do two I overcome? separate things, kind of. Yeah, it's a little bit weirdly worded. How do I overcome anxiety feeling of feeling alone and my kids moving away? So I guess it's just um, um, anxiety about feeling lonely. Um, after the kids have moved. Big yeah. change. It's it like is a big so change. emotional. And yeah. why can't you why can't you n- not like that that, right? It's an adjustment. It's it's sad. Mm-hmm. It's a change. And it's almost like, well, that's gonna make me feel I don't like that feeling. I'm used to my kids being home. I'm gonna be sad when they're gone. <gasps> now I'm having anxiety because I can't feel this feeling. Again, anxiety really is the good guy. It shows up when you're probably it senses a battle. You're probably bracing yourself for something, battling something. And again, if the story about your kid, if your kids aren't jerks and you're like, oh my God, how many more days till they move out? You're, there's probably not anxiety for that person because they're like, tick, tick, right? Tick, tick. When are they going? But if it's, oh, I'm going to be sad. I, I miss my children. And so we, again, anxiety shows up when we fight, we, we fight sad. We fight vulnerability. Well, I'm not used to being alone. I don't like to be alone. And so let it. The feeling of anxiety is not the sign of an anxiety disorder. Just like if, if you put, take off anxiety. I'm feeling sad thinking about my kids moving out when they go away to school. Okay. I would be too. Why can't you feel sad? Mm-hmm. Why yeah. can't you feel feelings? And I, I, you know, anxiety in, in phases where big changes, uh, I'd say it's normal. And you might also maybe fear or part of you fear that um, part of your identity is, is going with your children, right? Because maybe your 
you're at home, you're taking care of them, you're cooking for them, you're just, just being there and caring. And that part then falls away too. And it is kind of weird. What do you do now? Who are you now? Right? There's so many things that are involved with that. So, and what often happens is we only notice the anxiety, like the top of the emotions, because it screams the loudest. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, your kids are moving out. You don't like being alone. Oh my God, oh my God, what are you going to do now? But if we take the time and be aware of what is what is it all? Uh, what are other things that are beneath this anxiety or next to the anxiety? I might also be, as Michelle said, I might be sad. I might not know who I am if my kids are not around and I don't have my mother role anymore, at least not as intense as I'm having it now. Um, all of these things play a role. And I would advise you to maybe take a pen and paper and just write everything down. Maybe all the underlying emotions that are there too and not just the anxiety and then see how um, if, if that makes a difference. Right. If you can note that the anxiety is really just the thing that is warning you of something, but that that doesn't need to be addressed directly, but more the story beneath it. Okay. Um, I'm not only getting more anxious and about more things, but I also seem to find it harder to respond well and to allow it. What am I doing wrong? I'm going to read it again, Michelle. I know it's weird when you don't I'm actually writing the words. I just oh, okay. <laughs> more I'm not only more getting more anxious and about more things, but I also seem to find it harder to respond well and to allow it. What am I doing wrong? Well, I mean, it's hard to do. It's not easy, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm getting more anxious about more things and I'm probably treating more things as problems and trying harder. If I'm trying really hard to allow, that's not allow. And then we get down ourselves for not doing it right. And I have to do it just right. And now I'm more anxious and <clears throat> practice, right? It's, and it's a little bit of a lighter approach. Oh, God, God, now I'm anxious because of this. Oh, now I wasn't anxious going to the grocery store. Now I'm going anxious going to the grocery store. Why can't I just allow? You, how about you guys tell us? You pop in the, um, oh, somebody just heard that was my question. I've been practicing for so mm -hmm. long. Oh, hi, hi. Esther. Esther. Yeah. <laughs> and so practicing for so long, but practicing with the intention of what? My God, how many times am I going to go to the grocery store with, until this anxiety goes away? What am I doing wrong? If that's the intention, 90% of our one-to-one -one calls, at least mine, right? Of like, I'm trying to use there, I'm trying to accept and allow, but it's still there. Or now I'm anxious about other things. What am I doing wrong? And mm -hmm. it's usually still with that intention of doing something for anxiety to be gone. Mm -hmm. And Esther... Um, keep in mind, just because you allow, it doesn't mean that your anxiety is going to fade. It might in that moment, but it might increase. It might fluctuate over the next days. Right? It will. The trend will go down, right? but it's not going to happen right away. And a lot of people, I think we all have been down that route where, where part of us feels like if I just allow it right enough, Right? If I just do everything correctly, then it has to go down. It has to. And if it doesn't, or if I notice that I'm getting even more anxious, that means I'm doing something wrong. It doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. And it, but trying to, to, to make it perfect so it goes away is just another control behavior. Right? Yeah. And don't try and measure your progress, especially in the early days in in how anxious am I feeling right now? That's not a good marker of progress. It is not. It's always how willing, your willingness is a marker of progress. How willing am I today to move through this, to be my friend while I feel shit, <laughs> to right. allow the anxiety, to try to not take it seriously, to still go to the meeting or or to, to cook dinner and, and be with my family, although... I feel like this. How willing am I? And the willingness part is important. And uh, Esther just said, yes, the willingness is going down too. Of course, right? that's right. normal too. You cannot always would be 100% willing to, to experience hardship because it's hard, right? 
going through anxiety is a hard thing and, and it takes a lot of your energy and I'm, I'm holding these them. i'm holding these chats here because new chats are coming and i'm trying to scroll back but i see esther one of your responses is oh but i am doing a lot wrong i can't act as if i am not anxious nobody told you to do that yeah i can't if you're to. sad i'm not going to tell you act as if you're not sad i'm saying act yeah. you can be anxious and safe you don't have to bullshit yourself. No, I'm not anxious. No, fine. You can be safe and be anxious. I'm telling you, just be anxious. Just allow your body to be in a heightened state without you fighting a heightened state. You know, and like even the comment right after that, I don't get it. I scream in my head, allow, but I don't feel better. That's not allow. That's me trying to, to cast a spell. And if I say the words just right, I can change that feeling. That's not no, what allow, allow us, yeah. means. Feel the feeling. Yeah. You're it's not like allowing my, stuff. It doesn't get rid of the feeling. Yeah. Have you ever tried to, to love somebody really hard? You can't. You, you can't. You can't make yourself do it. And it's the same with, with allowance, the passive thing. Allowance happens naturally as soon as you make the choice to not resist. There is, no, there is resistance and there is allowance. <laughs> Not much else. So as long as I'm actively resisting, I can't be allowing. But as soon as I stop resisting, I'm going to move into allowance. So sometimes it's it's worth going on a dare diet. <laughs> so just dropping all that you know, all the tools, all the approaches you're trying to use at the moment for a few days to um, get into the right mindset. Just let go of everything for a few days. Kind of like do a reset and, and start again. Have you noticed that, Michelle? Some people, when they're really in it and like, oh, now I'm going to do this. Now I'll use diffusion and now this. And I'm going to use this analogy. And it's like, it becomes this big mess that is really yeah. hard to untangle. And, and that, that was never really our goal. Good. Yeah, no. that was never, it was never our goal, guys. Mm. No matter how much more content we put out there, our goal is to not get you to spend more time reading it. And and if we have other people come on our podcast, not to spend two more hours a day following this one and this one and this one and this one. Maybe in the very beginning, that's, that's my little caveat. If you don't know how this upside down approach to anxiety works, fill yourself with this information for like a little bit of time. Okay. And then you teach yourself the information by spending less time with us and more time with life, more time treating what's happening as safe treat, like taking your eyes off your body because I am growing trust in my body. And that means I'm going to sort of immerse myself back into life while my body just comes along with me. That's really the goal of dare. This is designed to be a, a short term relationship. The whole idea of the app and adding things, even like the premium, the uh, lifetime memberships, it's because overall, this stuff is good for your overall wellness and well being. But it doesn't mean I need to cope through an anxiety disorder for the rest of my life and rely on these programs. Yeah. And nothing's going to happen if you stay away from Dara, from, from your tool, right? your arsenal mm -hmm. of things. No, nothing's going to happen. Same, the same like somebody said, oh, I have anxiety about letting go uh, of my anxiety tools. Well, they're not helping at the moment, right? Let go. <laughs> if you're still experiencing anxiety <laughs> about letting, letting go. Again, um, it's so easy to turn all of this knowledge into a mental construct, but it's not all of what we're saying, all... The tools and techniques are meant to help you develop an attitude, another attitude, a way of being rather than a way of doing something. Because doing something with anxiety usually translates into doing something against anxiety. Mm -hmm. Or to put it even simpler, what can I, how can I use tool X to change something here? Right? I want to change that. But we're trying to teach you to take tool X, Y, Z to change yourself. Yeah. Michelle, I think you said it once. It's a relation, relational problem you have with anxiety. Yeah, it is. You have a relationship yeah. problem. It's it's your relationship yeah. when anxiety shows up. And again, what, and that's why when, like you were saying, the person who was doing fine and then they had actual life stressors and their stress alarm rang, it's supposed to. That's, That's what's supposed thing. to happen. Just like you watch a sad movie and you got sad again. You're like, oh my gosh, sad's back. No, that's not, that's, then that's 
somehow, somewhere along the line, somebody taught you or you were taught or you've learned that this present feeling, persona non grata, not allowed, can't be sad. And if sad comes back or anxious comes back or anger comes back, that's the problem. That's actually the problem. You deciding I can't feel this feeling again, it's the problem. And so if if I felt anxious and then I get frustrated because I felt anxious, then notice your intention is probably off a little bit. Because if your intention is, I shouldn't feel anxious anymore. Why am I still having these feelings? I'm using, I'm doing all these things. Why isn't it gone? It's because you're still trying to get rid of. Yeah, my bottom line is um, you're fearing your own body and mind. You're fearing your own stress response. And that's it's really, really key to to become, again, the person that you once were, a person that went through stress and sadness and grief without fearing those feelings. They're still all horrible, right? Grief is not a nice feeling and sadness is not a nice feeling. And being sensitized and uh, hangover or sick or none of that is, is pleasant but it's still very different than being sad and being afraid of being sad right mm-hmm. being hangover and being afraid of now being hungover right feeling grief and now being afraid of oh my god what is this grief going to do to me maybe i i can handle the grief it's going to overwhelm me and then i'm going to die right yeah and, it's, and that's why it's always the same stories attached to all always. different things it's yeah it's like i feel so disconnected today and somebody else is like oh my gosh, I'm still so disconnected. Disconnected came back. What if this lasts forever? This is going to affect my life. I can't handle this. When will this go away? Did you try this? Have I tried this? Have I tried that? And and so that's why it doesn't really matter what the thing, whatever this, that's why I just gave up and made a black scribble. This is the subject (laughs) of your problem. Your problem lies here. It's the relationship problem, how I treat this thing I don't like. And we're We're trying to get you to drop the fight of go back to not liking it. You don't have to like this at all. Most people don't like the stuff they call us for. Nobody's fighting peace and joy and orgasms. We're all fighting the stuff we don't like. Just don't like it. This is the piece that labels it as danger. And so go back to not liking the parts of our bodies that are not likable. You never had to like them. Our bodies have the capacity to feel discomfort. And our job is to grow our tolerance for that natural discomfort. Yeah. And uh, Barbara asked, so if um, uh, I can't see the question anymore, I I hope um, it's correct. I think you asked, Barbara, so if I'm frustrated by it, does it mean I'm still stuck in it? Is, Is that about correct? No, it does not. I want to give you an example. Yesterday, my advanced call was tra- actually my intention was to start with a, a short mindfulness exercise, and I call it the screenshot. So the screenshot is just checking in with yourself for a second. How is my body feeling? Is there an underlying emotion? And what is my intention in doing whatever I do today? So yesterday it was what is my intention in joining this call today? It was the hardest <laughs> exercise for people. The hardest, and why? Because it was almost impossible to just check in, notice, and let it be there without analyzing it, without trying to predict the future, without trying to understand where it's coming from and what this means. This is where all the anxiety lives. Mm -hmm. Try and just be present with frustration. I'm frustrated today about my anxiety. Done. Done. (laughs) Period. And this is because... And, and what does it mean now that I'm frustrated? Does that mean I'm still stuck in it? So how can I let go of my, mm-hmm. my frustration? But damn it, the more I'm trying to let go, the more frustrated I get. Oh my God, I'm a failure. I can't do this. You see, <laughs> instead of just noticing and letting it be, it's the hardest thing for anxious people to learn to just notice and then move on. It's, it sounds like such a simple exercise, but but try it out. Three times a day, set a timer on your phone and just check in with yourself. How do I feel? Oh, I feel restless. My body is full of nervous energy. Okay, that's mm-hmm. it. I don't need to Notice know why. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yep. that's what's why. there. Mm-hmm. Is it because I haven't only slept three hours? Oh my God. And what is this going to be today? You see, the story, the, the past and the future, right? conclusions and predictions, conclusions and predictions. This is really where we get stuck, not in the feeling itself. Okay.
Oh, time's almost up, Michelle. Three minutes. I'm giving time for one more, you? maybe one more. Yeah, of course, us. of course. I, I just think. Sorry, you guys. We couldn't bring anyone in today because Michelle didn't find the button. <laughs> no, I found the button. Oh, you I found, found the, the button. button. <laughs> I, I just want to blame you. No, just joking, guys. We're just running out of time today. Sorry. Next time, We'd love to. Okay. Um. Do you, is there any question, Michelle? You, you had in mind that you. I can't loved? see them. Remember. Oh, none of them. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 if I click off of here, I don't know if I can come back. So just pick um, mm. whatever. Tell me a number from one, one uh, between. Seven. Oh, that was fast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah, somebody just asked, Hi. will this be a podcast? This will, this, this actual webinar will be on our app probably within 24 hours. So if you scroll down on the main page, the last, I think, recording or two of our webinars will be on the app. Eventually, our older recording, our older webinars get chopped up and put into podcasts. Go on any, I don't know, wherever you get your podcast from and look under Dare Response, um, Dare Anxiety, search somehow, and um, and it should pop up there. And then you can follow us. You could bring us uh, on the drive on drives with you and on your walks. Can't see us, but you can hear us. Okay, I'm just um, trying to pick something that we haven't covered today. When you have a health diagnosis, whether it's bad or uncertain news, how do you apply it there um, then? How do you deal with real health problems and symptoms as per the doctor? I think that's a really good question, right? Because we often talk about um, anxiety about things that are just in our heads. Oh, what if I go crazy? What if this? What if that? But but sometimes there's a real life scare. And there's anxiety yeah, and that, that question comes, comes up a lot. Yeah, and I think it's it's a real good one. Want to start, Michelle? Yeah, and so that I think that question comes up a lot too because people think, well, dares for anxiety, and how can I dare because I actually have a health problem or I have a health concern, and then comes up with like, well, there's symptoms of my health problem, and then there's symptoms of anxiety. So how do I differentiate who gets stuck here? Post in the chat. So how do I differentiate between like, is this an actual, like what's happening in my body right now is actually my health problem or if it's anxiety, like if I'm dizzy because I have POTS or am I dizzy because it's anxiety? Like when do I know how to use DARE and when do I not know how to use DARE? Um, DARE is not like the, the right Phillips head screwdriver for the right screw. The idea of DARE is to be where you are and allow whatever's happening to happen. And then you attend to attendable things and you notice the noticeable things. So if I'm dealing with a health condition, you use dare to, if anxiety shows up to go, oh my gosh, you have a health condition. You still deal with the health condition while allowing the feeling of anxiety to possibly be present if it is. Does that yes, make sense, guys? And you, and you use the diffuse step of dare to bring yourself back into the present moment, because especially with uncertainty, oh my God, this could mean this and that. And usually it's it's not calming, calming things that your mind comes up with. Oh, you're going to be fine. It's nothing, right? It's going to be, oh my God, it's going to be something really bad. You might die. You might be in a lot of pain. Your, your life will be completely different. So, and when our mind goes to the future and, and imagines all those worst case scenarios. This is where we can use the diffuse step and say, oh, hold on a second, but now it's here, right? I notice I'm having a thought about the future that doesn't seem good. All right, my mind is doing that. Fine, thank you for that. But now is now. And what is going on now? Now I'm having a diagnosis or a pain or something that I have have to attend to and deal with. And that might be very uncomfortable, but I can be here and allow myself to move through that phase while I care for myself without adding more and more and more fear to it by allowing my mind to exaggerate. Right. It's, Most it's of this is on. uncertainty. Most of this is uncertainty. I, we have yeah. tons of posts about uncertainty. I have many little mm -hmm. pictures and diagrams about the coulds. If it could... It could. Your fight of here doesn't change what could. 
you still could have a diagnosis or not. I took a test. I could have something. I won't know for two weeks. That's right. The answer yeah. is yes. It's, it is certain uh -huh. that you could. Yeah. And and then that might come with a, but I don't want to. And then us doers, we tend to go into doing mode to try and do something about the coulds. You don't. You are allowed to have a heightened state while you're waiting for test results. Expect it. I would be. Yeah. I would yeah, be. Yeah, everybody would be, right? It's everybody okay to would be. be. Yeah. And and diagnosis and illness and pain always comes with, with some level of anxiety. That's, uh, it would be weird if you would not be feeling anxiety. Right? If you take a test to know or a biopsy to know if there was something malignant, who would not be anxious for those two weeks? Absolutely. Yeah. But but the trick lies really in noticing, allowing yourself to be anxious because it's normal. But how is your behavior? So are you sitting there and Googling the whole day what this might mean, reading experiences of other people who had the same biopsy and drive yourself mad? Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. This is the part that you can you can control. Not easy again, but just unfortunately part of life that we all, without exception, go through. Cool. Oh, that hour always goes by so fast. I know. Thank really you, does. everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. It's good to Thank see you. you. Bye. Everybody. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Dare Podcast. The Dare app has over 1 million downloads and is helping people all around the world to overcome anxiety and panic attacks. You can download the app for free at dareresponse.com.